Okay, welcome back to uh, the next part of the unit on infectious disease. Uh, this is Andy again. Today, I'm gonna to go over the history and science of the HIV epidemic. Uh, you'll see that even today, we have tons of misconceptions about this. To explore those, I want you to answer these nine questions. Uh, feel free to pause it at any point here. I'm gonna read through the questions as well. But pause it, write down these questions, one through nine in your notebook. Leave a lot of space because I want you to write your initial answers and then see how your answers change as you learn about the history of HIV. The questions include, when was the first case of HIV? Where did HIV originate? How long did the first, how, uh, how did the first human contract HIV? What is the difference between HIV and AIDS? Is HIV still a concern? What can be done to reduce the risk of contracting HIV? If you've been exposed to HIV, is there something you can do immediately? Once someone is infected with HIV, what can they do? And finally, number nine, who is at the greatest risk of contracting HIV today? So feel free to pause it here as we move on. So to answer number nine first, if you didn't answer one through eight correctly, you're of a group that's at higher risk of contracting HIV. Here's the origin of the virus. It's called the Cut-Hunter Hypothesis. Most people think the H that HIV originated in the 70s or 80s, or 1970s, 1980s. Uh, based on tissue samples they have found in remote hospitals in Africa, they have found two patients that died in 1920 and 1940 of what looks like AIDS. Based on the mutations in those viruses, they would have had a common ancestor in about 1904 or 05. The area is called Kinshasa in West Central Africa. I'll show you that on a map in the next slide. Uh, the virus originates in chimpanzees. Uh, chimpanzees are a common form of protein in this part of Africa. Uh, so if those of you who hunt know that once you clean an animal, there's a lot of blood involved, and it's pretty easy to have human to chimpanzee blood transfer. Uh, just so you know, in the 1980s, there were urban legends that people were fornicating with monkeys, and that's what caused this epidemic. Uh, that has not been confirmed. The most supported theory now is a cut hunter in 1904. Strangely enough, the virus originates not in the chimpanzees itself, but the virus is made up of two halves. It's two different viruses that join together. One impact, uh, one is found in the rhesus monkey, and the other is found in uh, a blue-nosed uh, mangibet. Um, those are both prey for the chimpanzee. Here's Kinshasa, Africa. There's a river that comes through this town that is named the Ebola River. Yes, this is the same region where the Ebola virus originates. One weird thing about this virus is we don't actually know how it went global so fast in the 1980s. Uh, in the 80s and 90s, and even today, we blame young people, we blame uh, IV drug use, we blame the sexual revolution, we blame the gay community for what caused this epidemic to go global. Um, we're gonna to get towards the tail end, or when I get to the end of this, you'll see that the reason it went global is still kind of debated, but we have a better understanding. Last week, we talked about r naught, which is the rate of infection. The r naught of HIV does not explain how it went so global. It spread far faster than it should have to far too many people, but not yet. In the 1970s, people began dying throughout the world of this. Um, you don't die directly of HIV um, or AIDS. You die from your immune system shutting down and exposing you to opportunistic infections. Two common ones that were killing people, especially young people in the 1970s, were pneumocystis carinae and Kaposi's sarcoma. Pneumocystis carinae is a form of pneumonia. If you've had a bad cold, you've probably fought this off at some point in your life just fine. Usually it's not fatal. Um, Kaposi sarcoma is a skin cancer usually only found in men of Mediterranean descent later in life, and it never gets bigger than the size of the eraser at your end of your pencil. Here you can see a young man with rather advanced pneumocystis or with advanced Kaposi sarcoma. People also began dying of toxoplasmosis, which is why I'm a dog person. Cats are gross little monsters that poop in boxes and then walk on your kitchen counters. Um, Toxoplasmosis is caused by an amoeba found in cat poop. If they're walking on your counters with little poopy paws, you've probably eaten it. The good news is your immune system can fight it off fine. 
1980, um, we started noticing clusters of people dying. Uh, the U.S. infections are around 300. The way the CDC tra tracks uh, bad strains of pneumocystis carinae is through trimethoropin cephalooxyly or through pentamidine. Anytime someone gets prescribed that by a doctor, it basically gets flagged and sent to the CDC so they can make sure that there's not an epidemic forming. In 1981, the CDC ran a story because five men in Los Angeles all needed pentamidine. One thing the CDC kept out of their publication was that the five men were all young and gay. Uh, Secretary had actually flagged a concern when she got five requests for pentamidine in one day in 1977. The average is four a year. The CDC did nothing. Uh, in that same era, about a dozen people took ill in Philadelphia, and huge amounts of CDC funds were liberated to study it. The difference was they were straight, wealthy white people. That disease became named Legionnaire's disease, and it was found to originate in water dripping out of an air conditioning unit at a hotel. In 1980 to 82, the disease gets named Gay-Related Immunodeficiency Disorder, or GRID. That is not how we name diseases anymore. Um, we'll talk about why it became found in the gay community, or why it was found in the gay community first, but this is also why it's not appropriate to call COVID-19 the Chinese virus. Um, unless you want to go back to the 1980s, it's just not culturally appropriate. Um, the name of the disease is COVID-19. The disease, by the way, also was nicknamed gay cancer. At the national level, no news station, no newspaper, and the White House, no one was saying much about it yet. In 1982, the estimated cases in the U.S. are found in just these four groups. Over 1,000 cases have been found. What we now understand is the reason why it was first detected in the gay community was of these four groups, none of them had major power or control or influence in the United States at the time. Of those four disempowered groups, gay men were the only group that had access to health care. In 1982, the CDC renames it AIDS, standing for Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. Um, it's now also being found in people with hemophilia, convincing scientists that it might be spread by blood. At the time, we still didn't know how it was spread. One branch of the CDC was re researching recreational drug use to see if that was causing it. In 1983, we still don't know how it's transmitted. Um, the virus gets identified by a French laboratory. It's renamed HIV in 1986. This doctor here is a total jerk. He's an American doctor named Dr. Gallo. Here are photographs of the virus. Um, this is the virus attaching to white blood cells called helper T cells. Their fancy name from your other notes is called a CD4. These are the alarm system that basically detects an infection and launches your body's an entire immune response. The reason why HIV is so deadly is because it shuts down the alarm system. This doctor, Dr. Gallo, got tissue samples from the French laboratory to help confirm their findings. He ended up taking the pictures and trying to take credit. Uh, because he was a whiny little brat, he actually delayed release of the virus for months as the French laboratory and he duked it out. He ended up getting the patent on the discovery. They ended up, the French laboratory won the Nobel Prize. You can just consider him a giant jerk. Here's the difference between HIV and AIDS. HIV means the virus is present in your body. AIDS means your immune system. Those CD4 cells, the helper T cells we talked about, are down below 200. The normal range for most people is 800 to 2,000. Um, AIDS doesn't kill you directly. It shuts down your entire immune system, and other infections can take over, like Kaposi sarcoma or pneumonia or thrush or things that your body can fight off just fine. In 1983, the disease is now present in a few major cities in the United States. Politicians were actually suggesting things like a gay quarantine, um, putting all the gays on an island somewhere to protect all the straight people. That island would probably have pretty high resale value right now for real estate, um, much like Key West. Um, but that it does nothing to stop an epidemic like this. Uh, the estimated cases in the United States are around 10,000. Uh, this picture on the bottom was taken by a famous photographer who ended up dying of AIDS. Um, one weird thing about this picture is most of those people in that picture are close to your age, ranging in ages of 17 to 35. 
Most of them didn't survive to see 1990. If you go to most of the, uh, at the time in these cities, the biggest section of the newspaper was the obituary. If you go back to these cities today, you'll see they're missing an entire generation of gay men um, around the age of 60 to 70 um, because they just did not survive this epidemic. Uh, at the time, people could lose their job for showing symptoms of HIV or AIDS. Um, hospitals were often refusing to care for patients. Volunteer program set up, a group of lesbian nurses created a uh, hospital in San Francisco. The group of bizarre looking nuns you see on the top are the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence that started in San Francisco in the 1970s. They were a gender queer organization and their goal was to kind of shatter this concept of toxic masculinity. They also liked to torment tourists that were going to San Francisco to look at the weirdos by putting on scare drag and roller skates and shooting down the giant hills of San Francisco, screaming at the tourists. When their friends actually started passing away, they started going to bars and passing around coffee cans to raise money for AIDS charity. They are now credited with being the longest running AIDS organization in the world. In 1983, Ryan White uh, contracts HIV through a blood transfusion. Uh, before this moment, no national network ran anything about AIDS. Right after he contracted it in elementary school, news stations described him as the first innocent to contract HIV, which is a horrible example of stigma. In 83, right after he, was, he contracted HIV, New York Times runs their first story. Uh, the White House issues their first statement. Uh, funding towards HIV research actually kicks in. Uh, Reagan actually had cut the CDC's funding because, partially to balance budgets and reduce taxes, but also because he was a complete idiot who wanted to put laser shooting satellites in space to shoot at incoming missiles. And he called the project Star Wars. There's the Time Magazine article about it. Ten years ago, through open records, they established that the funding in 83 that Reagan had put into CDC funding went almost entirely to research the common cold. They justified it by saying the common cold is something someone with HIV could have. In 1985, Ryan White gets kicked out of middle school for being HIV positive. His family took the school district to court. Uh, the community response was not very supportive. Uh, people shot out the windows of their family house and the White family had to move. The school district defended their judgment by pointing out that he could actually get a bloody nose playing dodgeball, and then that bloody ball could hit someone else and give them HIV. It led to questions such as, why are so many people bleeding in gym class? In 1986, Surgeon General C. Everett Koop shocked the entire world, not just by his ability to rock a white beard with a bow tie, but he, started, he interrupted all national broadcast in the evening to just talk bluntly about HIV, and he said, wear a condom. At the time, the word condom was offensive in primetime television. The FCC would not allow it to be actually on any primetime TV. So he overrode that, and no one knew the word was allowed until they saw this old guy in a bow tie say it, and a bunch of old people clutched their pearls and freaked out. President Ronald Reagan says AIDS for the first time in his presidency and six years into the epidemic in 1986 as a result of visiting his friend Rock Hudson on his deathbed. In 1987, the U.S. bans immigrants who are HIV positive uh, from entering the country. AZT is released as an early HIV treatment. There are people currently alive because they re released this treatment. We no longer use AZT because we have better treatment options. Uh, those who are alive from AZT have a lot of side effects, including neuropathy, where they can't feel their hands or feet. The woman you see on the top picture is Princess Diana, credited as being one of the first international activists pointing out AIDS uh, awareness. At the time of this picture, she horrified the world by shaking a person's hand without wearing a glove. At the time, she was in line to become the next queen of England. This was the first time we had a major celebrity touching someone with HIV without wearing gloves. By 87, we knew it was from body fluid transfer and things like hugs and handshakes were very safe. Uh, this was actually put in front of, let me get this out of the way, the uh, uh, White House talking about silence equals death. It's still a slogan used when we talk about the federal government not responding appropriately during an epidemic.
1988, life expectancy is less than five years for someone with HIV. Uh, people didn't even want to find out if they had it because even if you did find out, you were going to die within five years. What you see at the bottom is the AIDS memorial quilt being put out in front of the White House. We no longer are adding to the quilt. At the time, families or loved ones would make a panel for anyone who died of AIDS, and they would assemble it in the world's biggest quilt. Uh, it is currently housed in four separate warehouses in California. Uh, we stopped adding to the quilt because it's now too large. In 1989, we understand infection development. The other thing that happened at this time is Greg Luganis, the Olympic diver and gold medalist, split his head on the high dive, and after he landed in the pool, came out and told the Olympic Commission he was HIV positive. News stations uh, around the world freaked out until, of all people, the janitors calmed down everyone by pointing out chlorinated water of pools keeps the virus uh, inactive. It destroys the virus. The infection de bloom, uh, or infection bloom is what you see in this graph. You see two lines. This line right here is called your viral load. This line right here are your CD4 or helper T cells, your immune response. What we now understand is when someone is exposed to HIV and it gets into their body, uh, in the course of around 12 weeks roughly, they will have a seroconversion moment where their viral load skyrockets all the way up here. This person might have night sweats, chills, swollen lymph nodes. They might feel like they have a bad flu and then it all goes away. They might also have no symptoms. From that moment on, in up to 20 years, that person will show no other symptoms but be contagious. During those 20 years, the viral load slowly starts creeping up, and it could be 20 years, it could be a few weeks. At the same time, the helper T or CD4 cells, sorry, the cells that actually protect your body slowly start to drop down, and right at this moment, is when a person starts to show symptoms of HIV or of AIDS. And this is the body shutting down. In 1990, this famous, famous photograph was taken by Therese Frere as a graduate project. Uh, the guy you see at the picture, uh, his name is David Kirby. This became an award-winning photograph that was then used by the company Benetton for the Christmas ads. Uh, the background of the story is David Kirby left his family home and was kicked out for being gay. He and his family patched things up when he found out he was dying of AIDS and he moved back in with them so that they could say goodbye to him and they could keep him safe. The other gentleman you see in there is the home health care nurse taking care of him. Uh, this picture is actually the last breath taken by D David Kirby. The photographer, Therese Frere, left the room out of courtesy for the family and they invited her back in just to show how this actually impacts families. In 1990, life expectancy for someone with HIV has increased to 10 years with the help of AZT. We're starting to see it in rural areas, including Native American reservations. Keith Herring was a street artist who started uh, putting all these images around subway tunnels. Uh, Keith Herring ultimately uh, died of AIDS in the 1990s. In 1990, uh, Liz Taylor started the Red Ribbon Campaign, which was for AIDS awareness. Um, in her autobiography, she admitted uh, that the true story behind the Red Ribbon was it was a corsage that fell apart. Um, you can see the Red Ribbon right there. Uh, when she didn't realize it till someone said, Liz, are you wearing that for AIDS awareness? And she said yes. At the time, she was a huge advocate for AIDS awareness uh, internationally. The FDA rap uh, authorizes the first rapid HIV response or rapid test which took four weeks to get your results. If you watch the movie Reality Bites with Ethan Hawke and Uma Thurman and Janine Garofalo, you can actually see what it was like in the 1990s waiting for your results. This was the health awareness poster from my health classroom in high school, by the way. If you had fever, sore throat, and rash, you might have HIV. We'll ignore that other bullet because you should practice safe sex. In 1993, France decides to get people over their hang-up over condoms by putting a giant 10-story condom on one of the statues in the Champs-Élysées. In 1994, MTV did their last bit of social relevance. Uh, in the first two seasons of The Real World, and Pedro Zamora was on the second season, MTV actually cast people that represented the real smatterings of the United States. 
Pedro Zamora was a young immigrant, uh, openly gay man, and this season was in San Francisco. During the season, or right before they started filming the season, he found out he actually had AIDS. Not HIV, but AIDS. The doctors gave him a few months to live. He contacted the producer and said, you probably don't want me on the show. The producer, who I met a few years ago on an AIDS ride, thought about it and said, we want you on the show more than ever because this is impacting your generation more than any others. During the course of that season, you actually saw Pedro fall in love, get married, and the season ends with him dying in the hospital. That still chokes me up remembering that episode. Um, sadly, MTV then discovered they made more money off spoiled little princess sweet 16 parties and pregnant teenagers, as well as drunk bros on reality shows. Uh, just so you know, that producer is so embarrassed, he still does AIDS rides every summer to raise upwards of $100,000 every summer for AIDS charities. In 1995, the life expectancy for someone with HIV is extended to 10 to 15 years with the help of protease inhibitors. Protease is a protein that the virus actually needs to replicate. Uh, your body doesn't need to make protease. It can survive without it. So think about it as if you've ever played with Legos, this would be running out of your favorite Lego. Uh, so protease inhibitors change the way we treated HIV. The new treatment is called the cocktail. Uh, it was partially developed with Dr. David Ho. Uh, the next breakthrough actually happens, sadly, as a result of a horrible event in US history. In October 1998, two young men beat Matt Shepard to death. The picture you see right here is the fence post. Uh, this is the sheriff, Reggie Flute, that untied Matt Shepard from the fence post. He was tied up with barbed wire and was mistaken initially for a scarecrow. Uh, Reggie Flute found out after Matt Shepard went to intensive care in Fort Collins, Colorado, that he had in fact been infected with HIV a few years earlier. He had been raped while on a family trip in Morocco and infected with HIV. Reggie Flute had shredded her hands, removing Matt Shepard from the barbed wire. So they, there was confirmed blood to blood transfer. Reggie Flute ended up going on a new therapy treatment where they put her on HIV medication, in this case, AZT, hoping to prevent transmission into her body of the virus, knowing that the virus was in there. A month later, they took her off the AZT, and Reggie Flute has never developed HIV. This is now called post-exposure prophylaxis, or PEP therapy. It is a therapy now used for healthcare workers and anyone else that might have had a moment of HIV exposure. Uh, in 1998 to 2000, uh, they're noticing that there's new treatments that are available, and there are some problems with the old treatments. Uh, the hardest problem with the old treatments is it was hard to get someone to stick to their medications. If you've been on a med prescription from your doctor, you know how hard it is to take all the pills you're supposed to take at certain times. The pills you see in this young man's hand, he has to take throughout the day, some in the middle of the night, some on an empty stomach, some with food. Some make him so nauseous that he can't hold down the next pill. Uh, and this was one of the big problems. Uh, some of the other complications you would see with some of these uh, HIV therapies are you would see loss of fat in the cheeks, as well as in the extremities, and sometimes a buildup of fat on the back of the shoulders, as well as in the front, called a crick's belly. Uh, in 2003 to 2005, and by the way, if you pause right here, this is about the moment that most HIV education ends in the United States. Uh, we don't talk about any breakthroughs from this point on. Even weirder, most HIV stuff ends in about 1994 when Pedro Zamora passed away. Uh, not because health classes are backwards, but because there's no expectation that we update the information. Everything you're gonna hear from this point on is usually not covered in health classes. In 2003 to 2005, President Bush announced $15 billion for the emergency plan for AIDS relief in Africa. The prevention portion though is criticized because it teaches abstinence only. One of the states that's leading abstinence-only education in the United States is Texas. They're also leading the country in unplanned teen pregnancies and sexually transmitted infections among teenagers. Um, 
but the plan also provides much needed HIV AIDS treatment funds to 15 nations. In 2006 to 2007, HIV lifetime treatment is shown to extend life by 24 years, but this is the cost. This is one reason why wealthy celebrities and wealthy people have survived the AIDS epidemic. This changes in 2007. Atripla is the first modern HIV medication, and just so you know, Atripla is no longer used. The modern versions of Atripla include Bictarvi, uh, Genvoya, and Discovi. And it's based on a gobstopper. Rather than the handful of pills you saw earlier, this pill has time-release conings. So the person only has to take one pill a day. One layer of the pill is designed to open in the stomach. Another is designed to open in the small intestine. And the last layer opens in the large intestine. This pill changed adherence or ability of patients to stick to their HIV medications. Uh, a patient needs to stick to their pills with about 90 to 95% accuracy, meaning they can only miss one dose every 20 days. That was hard to do with that handful of pills. These layers, by the way, were developed by 3M, the company that makes scotch tape and post-it notes. In 2008, the CDC noticed that HIV is worse than we thought. Um, infection rates were still going up. They'd gone up 11% in five years. In 2009, Polls show that most Americans no longer consider AIDS a problem. Uh, high school students are starting to think that AIDS has been cured or that it's no longer contagious or AIDS was the deadly strain, HIV is the non-deadly strain. In 2011, HIV prevention gets a new breakthrough called PrEP therapy. The medication is another version of AAAA called Truvada. If a person uh, is HIV negative and they take this medication once a day, they reduce the chance of HIV transmission from 96% to 99%. Condom use is 96% effective, which is still highly effective. Uh, the reason why condom use is not higher than 96 is condoms break or they slide off um, or other things. 99% um, transmission prevention is the highest rating you could get besides abstinence only. And in the case of Truvada getting approved, it was approved initially for serodiscordant couples. One of the biggest fears someone living with HIV has is giving it to their HIV negative partners. But this was not improved for just people in monogamous relationships. This was approved for anyone who thinks they're at risk of an HIV infection. Uh, during the FDA debates on whether or not to approve it, politicians were afraid that the term they used was this was going to generate Truvada whores. People that now that this was available, we're going to start having all the sex they wanted. Um, since this has been approved, there actually has been increased rates of syphilis and gonorrhea. However, since this has been approved, there's been, for the first time in US history, a decreased rate in HIV transmission among people. Um, one of the politicians that defended approving it said, this protects everyone, and if we can keep one person from getting it, we also keep that person from giving it to others. Um, PrEP therapy is now approved in the United States. Bear in mind, I'm not telling you to go on PrEP therapy because a teacher cannot give medical advice. I am telling you that this is out there and it is covered by insurance. Sadly, a lot of insurance companies put a lot of barriers to patients getting it, even though it's FDA approved. Um, some of the barriers include requiring a prior authorization, which delays the refill by about a week. Uh, they also change the price so that the doctor has to write overrides for it. Um, which is a real sh sad thing to say about insurance companies, but they're terrible companies. Now, let's get onto how the virus went around the world so fast. The r naught for HIV is around two, maybe 1.2. The way it spread around the world had an r naught significantly higher, something closer to measles of around 11. Um, at the time, people were blaming IV drug users, gay men, and the sexual revolution. Uh, one of the other persons blamed was called Patient Zero. Uh, his name was Gaten Dugas. Uh, he was a flight attendant based in Canada. Um, this is a little news clip about him. Um, what we now understand is if you approach someone and say, there's a virus you've never heard of, that you could get and give to other people, and it might be in your body right now because everybody who's been in contact with you is dying, it does something to your brain. 
you want to deny it. And one of the ways to deny it is to engage in the exact activities that people are saying are dangerous. Uh, Mary Mellon, whose nickname in history is Typhoid Mary, did the same thing with food handling in the early part of the 20th century. Gaten Dugas was approached and was told, a lot of people that you've had sex with have died. We think you are the common link. He didn't believe it um, and kept having sex. Uh, he was vilified for the longest time in history, and they kept calling him patient zero, even though he would have been about 16 when there was the first modern death of HIV. And the first death from AIDS was about 50 years before he was born. Um, now, another thing to know is in 2017, the CDC established that people who are undetectable are non-contagious. Um, modern HIV tests for someone living with HIV are so sensitive, they can detect the smallest amount of viruses in a person's sample of blood. Um, what we now know is someone who's undetectable has no virus to be contagious in their bloodstream. Um, so this is a huge thing to point out the importance of access to health care and treatment also protects those around you. Oh, I also forgot to mention, let's go back. In 2011, when this was approved, the only news network that ran a piece on it was National Public Radio. It still didn't end up in national news. Even now, Facebook does not allow ads for PrEP therapy. Another thing you know is support with people with HIV. In Northern Colorado, it's NCAP. Other states have similar ones. Um, in Wisconsin, it's the AIDS Resource Center. Um, these uh, collect money from CDC and federal and state grants. Uh, people doing AIDS rides around the country raise money for them. What these groups actually do is they raise money to provide education on AIDS, HIV. If someone finds out they're HIV positive, these caseworkers will reach out to that person and help them get things in order, including insurance, make sure they have access to health care, make sure they have a job, healthy food, a way to get to work, that they have a safe living situation. The reason why they do all this is when people have all of these things supported, they tend to adhere to their health care, and someone with HIV medication is less contagious. Uh, so another thing that these programs are now doing is fighting stigma, trying to get people to do AIDS rides and actually bike through remote parts of the countryside, announcing to complete strangers they're HIV positive. Uh, 15 or 10 years ago, when I did an AIDS ride, when this was started, I was the first person to willingly wear one of these uh, flags on my bike in public. In 1930, though, let's go back to the history of the HIV epidemic. What we now understand is two things amplified the virus, changed its r naught. It still is roughly the contagion rate, r naught of a little over one. From 1930 to 1960, Kinshasa had a um, big mining community, and one of the big side misses there was prostitution. To treat um, STDs in this region, they were filling giant syringes with antibiotics and lining people on, on the street using the same syringe going up and down the street without cleaning it. At the time, we didn't know that dirty needles could transmit microscopic viruses. So that was the first application. The second application happened in the 1950s as a result of this dictator called Duvalier who took over Haiti. If he didn't like you and found you to be a political enemy, you were turned into what we would now consider a zombie. It was done with the toxin from pufferfish called tetrodotoxin. Um, the toxin would slow down your heart rate and shut down your breathing so you looked dead. People that survived this poisoning described being motionless, getting buried in the ground. Uh, one of the side effects of tetrodotoxin is it fries your brain. Um, weeks later, these enemies would be found on the street, wandering the streets, and that created the modern underst like understanding of what we consider zombies because they would become the slaves of Duvalier. So if you became a, if you were an enemy of Duvalier in Haiti, you fled. A lot of those people fled to Africa, um, where they would have been exposed to the virus. Years later, when Duvalier left office, uh, they returned to Haiti. Right around the same time, the Red Cross started making new blood therapies for hemophilia. So um, what we now understand is some of those hemophilia treatments further amplified the virus. Um, because hemophilia is a result of not having enough platelets in your blood. One of the early forms of blood therapy for hemophilia was to take platelets from dozens of units of blood from different people 
and inject it with someone with hemophilia. Um, the other thing was this became a major blood bank for U.S. surgeries as well. So both of these things combined are what we now understand amplified the virus. Uh, modern stuff, uh, in the 19th, or, or in 2015, the governor of Indiana cut actual HIV outreach, including needle exchange and education in Indiana. Shortly afterwards, it uh, caused a massive increase in HIV in remote parts of Indiana. This is one of the reasons why funding the CDC and infectious disease research is incredibly important to protect everyone. Uh, I hope this filled in some information on HIV. Here are some of the source of information I used for this. Uh, one of the other things I used was a book called And the Band Played On as well.